Uh, uh, obviously, this is uh, this is cool and kind of weird, funny as well. Um, just getting a kick out. If y'all can see this setup, man, it is it's ridiculous. I got a box on top of my son's high chair pointing at the, the screen so we can get the best look possible, man. But really appreciate you guys um, just uh, following up with me on Twitter yesterday and, and the guys that have reached out wanting to be a part of this. Um, the question you guys uh, po uh, pose, I want to try to answer as many of those as possible. I um, want to try to keep it within about an hour as well, not overdo it, but hopefully um, how I tell people how I kind of approach these things whenever I'm on the other side of the camera or out in the audience or whatever it is. I just want to always try to get one thing, if possible. At, at, if Hopefully I get a lot of things from whoever I'm watching speak, but if I can just get one, that's really, I, I can leave. There's been a ton of times where I've gone and, and watched different speakers and got one thing that have really changed uh, my perspective as a coach and helped me be a better coach. So that's, uh, that's my hope. Um, for this this opportunity we have right now is to uh, to accomplish that. Um, next next Friday I'm actually doing a glazier an online glazier clinic. Um, I, I don't have the time yet, but it's going to be next Friday, and we're gonna, I'm going to do two topics. I'm going to talk wide zone, outside zone, um, and then I'm also going to talk pass pro. And so I'll, I'll if I have time today I'll hit on a little bit of that. But if you if you're really wanting to to dive deeper into those um, two different aspects of coaching running backs, then that, that'll that be the time for us to really get into it. Or you can just follow up with me and I'll, if I have time, we can sit down and, and talk talk some ball and just talk over our reads and stuff like that. But the first thing and that I don't usually get to speak um, to most coaches that I, I work with about is philosophy. Um, just different things. I think it's, it's valuable for us to hear different perspectives on philosophy. And so that's uh, the first thing I want to talk about, some great questions that were asked. Um, the first thing kind of from a college coach perspective, as you see on the screen right here, I, had, I made an acronym for RBs. Um, RBs to me, um, the R at our level recruit. I want to try to find game-changing talent, and then I want to find program-changing character. Um, those are two things um, that you can't coach. You know, um, our job is to get the most out of our players, but when those, they have those two things covered, that obviously helps. It makes our lives a lot easier. And so um, the R stands for recruiting. The B is ball security. Um, that's something they're going to hear if they come in to play for me as a freshman. Um, and then they, they walk on – or, sorry, they, they – uh, let's say they redshirted and they're there for five years. Every day for five years they're going to hear um, ball security. Uh, be a major emphasis is on the wall. It's uh, – they hear – 15, 20 times that practice, they hear in the meetings. That's something that I'm going to always preach because I tell my guys, if you protect the football, if you at least give yourself a chance to have success in the game, right? So we're playing the number one team in the country. We have no chance of beating that number one team if we put the ball on the ground. Okay, they may just be better than us and they may beat us, but at least we give ourselves a chance. On the flip side, if we play the worst team in college football and we go put the ball on the ground left and right, now we close the gap and give those guys an opportunity um, to beat us when we really are talent-wise the better team. And so ball security is my number two emphasis um, that I'm, I'm really ingrained my, my guys day, day one. And then standards. Um, standards is something I'm high on. I, I call it with my running backs, I call it the standard. The standard is doing more than what you're expected of. And so I've never I personally recruited a running back because I looked – on their film and said, man, I, I just can't wait to get this guy here. He's a great path protector. I don't know if I've ever even seen a running back put pass pro on their um, highlight film. And so um, people don't expect much out of us in that round, but I want us to take pride in that. That most running back groups may not take pride in it, but we're going to take pride in it. Finishing every play, whether we have the ball uh, in our hands or not, I want us to, um, I want us to take pride in the details. And so I'm very detail-oriented. I'll show you here with some of the techniques and some of the uh, things that I use on a day-to-day -day basis to, to emphasize and double down on the culture of having a high standard um, as a player. And, and so I'll show that. But those are my three things. Uh, recruiting, ball security, and standards um, are the three things to me that, that I hang my hat on on a daily, daily basis as a coach. I recruit as hard as I can so I can get the guys that I hopefully don't have to coach as much. Um, even if they're a great player, they got to protect the football or they're just a waste of talent. I can't play them. They're, they're 
costing our team a chance for success. And then standards is no matter how talent you, talented you are, you have to have pride in your personal uh, performance and what you put on that tape every day. So that, those are my three main things. Uh, do we have any questions on that, Justin? Uh, no, sir. Actually, I uh, closed it off for now, just for about the first 20 minutes. Okay, no, cool. No. All right, cool. So, so here, uh, just talking about position meetings, is it, is it clear on there? Can you see it? Uh, the words are a little blurry. Okay. Ho hopefully. Well, I mean, they're, they're small, though, so okay. we can see that as position meetings. Okay. So, just, we'll talk about just position meetings real quick, and I, I'm – I went to school for health and PE, um, so I do actually have a heart for teaching as well. I mean, you could say health and PE is not a big deal or whatever, but uh, it was a pretty good program, and I actually learned some really good teaching methods that have prepared me as a coach. One of them is the type of learning environment um, that we create. I was blessed when we were at BYU. Uh, coach Sataki, he really forced us out of our comfort zone in creating engaged learn learning environments. And engaged learning environments, um, there's, I can go into the, the definition of it all that, but long story short, it's just not the old school way that most of us probably grew up with. The coach is sitting, leaning back in his chair, holding the clicker. And he, everybody in the room is falling asleep because he's just letting it run, and, and he may give a coach a point here and there. But everybody in the room, their the backs are to the coach. We're all laid back, comfortable in our seats, lights off, and we're all falling asleep with those and all. So the type of environment I want to. Uh, really promote is I want them to have fun learning, but also have them make them comfortable in verbalizing uh, the coaching points that I'm trying to emphasize daily. And so uh, just an example, um, when we're in a meeting, if I'm coaching Justin, uh, instead of me saying, hey, Justin, right here on inside zone, you need to make sure you make that backside cut. All right, next play. Instead, so instead of doing that, I'm going to say, hey, Justin, talk to me about this. Talk to me about your uh, track right here. What, what, what's your track on this play? Well, coach, I'm supposed to be at the butter center. Okay, good. What's your read on this play? Well, I'm reading the nose guard. Okay, good. Okay, what do you think you could have done better on that run? Well, honestly, coach, I probably should have pressed the heels a little bit more. That's exactly we're, – we're, we're still getting the same thing accomplished, but now I'm empowering them to learn more, to be open. And then I always tell my guys this, if you can – if you can – say what your, your responsibility is with confidence, then when you get out on the field, you're going to be able to play confident. And so you'll see when the freshmen get up there um, that, you know, when they're, I'm first kind of throwing them through the fire with some of these questions, they're like uncertain. They're like, I'm like, hey, what is your track on this? Uh, butt of the center. And yet he's right, but I never let him get away with that. I say, I don't know. I, I'm not the one that runs the play. You tell me, what is your, your, what is your track? And he's like, yeah, butter the center coach. And so not only do I want them to be able to know their assignment, I want them to verbalize it with confidence. And so um, that's some, so, some different techniques. That's one way. Peer coaching is something that I like to utilize. Um, same scenario, Justin just ran the inside zone. Instead of me asking Justin um, that same question, I might say, hey, Caleb, Caleb, co coach me up right here. What, what, do you, uh, what do you think Justin could have done better at? And it, it's – it creates an atmosphere of learning, it creates an atmosphere of confidence, and then you're, you're verbalizing it with, uh, with confidence. And when you go on the field, you're thinking of the coaching points in your head, and you're just that much smoother in that you're learning that much better. Um, sometimes I'll just do random selection just for a random question, like, hey, we're just watching, we're getting ready to uh, watch some film on, or watch an outside zone play. I might pick up in the freshman, hey, Sione, what do you have on this? What do you have on outside zone? He sits up in a seat. Uh, coach, I'm, I'm, he goes through all the coaching points. And so random selection, and to me, I like that technique to force guys to always be attentive in meetings. Um, and so that's, that's another uh, thing that I like to use, utilize with anything they learn. Um, role reversal. This is something I don't do a lot, but I think it's really good for your older players that you're, you're kind of searching for ways to keep them you know, engaged in meetings, to keep them – uh, open-minded as far as as a learner and continue to find ways to, to help them learn. Um, I'll say, like, uh, last year we had Tyson Williams, senior running back, really good player. And so sometimes I say, hey, Tyson, come grab the clicker, coach us up on, coach, coach us up on this play. And so he goes up there and he's, okay, we got inside zone right here. 
hey, good job doing this, doing that, doing that. Two things that I love about that, and this is another thing I learned that I learned from Coach Satake at BYU, and I love it, is it not only does it force him to get in the shoes of the coach, which is obvious in that situation, it forces him out of his comfort zone. He has to verbalize it even in a more confident way. But it also, as a coach, it teaches me the things that are sticking. And so that's one thing I like about that, using that tool, is he may go up there and say, hey, right there, you did a good job of pressing the heels, good job hugging that vertical seam right there, and then good job, um, you know, staying, getting two hands on the ball in traffic. When he, when he verbalizes those things, to me, that I, I know what sticks. Then also, on the other side, he may, he may miss out a, coach, a couple coaching points that I know he should have said that I need to think, rethink. Maybe, hey, maybe it doesn't make sense to him, or maybe I need to verbalize it in a different way, a, a better buzzword, so to speak, so that they're uh, more in tune and engaged when it comes to that coaching point. And so those are, uh, those are, those are my core things that I use. Another good uh, exercise while we're in the spring and things like that is give them whiteboards. Just give them 20, just pair them up, give them 20 seconds to answer a question, draw it up like, hey, everybody draw up a, a 50 front and then give them 20 seconds. They're working with their partner, drawing it up, and then at 20 seconds, have them hold the board up and then you just go through. Hopefully, sometimes you want to give them pretty easy questions just to kind of encourage and empower them in that in that sense but sometimes you want to make it a little bit tougher as well so that you can double down and, and correct it it's it's easy to just walk up on the board and draw the 50 front i want to know exactly what they know and so sometimes i may be wasting my time coaching something that they already know or i might be neglecting things and and taking it for granted thinking that they know something that they don't so those are all just great um engaged learning examples um, that I really love um, and I, I believe in as a coach. I've seen guys maximize their ability from these type of coaching points um, and accelerate the process of learning and growing as a learner. Right and then the last, last but not least, this is more so um, what, I, what I brought in from my teaching experience um, is learning environment. That's something that I don't think a lot of coaches really take time in, to take into. Um, but I don't like the old school way of the coach. I'm standing behind, holding the clicker. Everybody's in front of me with their, I'm looking at the back of their head and they're just leaning back in their seat. I don't see their eyes. I don't know what's going on in their mind while I'm coaching it up. So if you see, can you see this, Justin? Like this, this diagram here? I can't see what the words say, but I, I mean, I can see the shapes. Okay, so the shape, so this here um, is the screen. Right, and then I have, this is just an example of how I had it at BYU. Um, but the th we had two pairs of desks on each side and then I was in the back of the room. The same thing, I'm still in the back of the room, but now I, these guys are all seated in these, um, in these different sections and I can see their eyes. And I look, I like, when I coach, when I coach them, I want to see their reaction in their eyes because I want to know what's sticking. I want to know if they got that, what the heck is those talking about? My, you know, look in their eyes. I want, I want to be able to see their reaction. And I think it also holds them accountable to be upright and to be focused because they never know when coaches gonna make eye contact with them or when he's gonna pick, you know, pick on them to uh, to to answer a question. And the other thing I like about this is I like always having a little bit of space, like right in the middle where everybody can see, where every, people don't got to stand up and this and that. Because there's a lot of times you know the running back coach, somebody might say you might be showing them a new footwork or something. I wanted to be able to walk up front and show, hey, we're going to do scissors step on our outside zone now or different things like that. And so that's – I'm huge into these two things, man. I, I've seen it help my guys more than – it's just little simple things, and it's a little more uncomfortable for us as coaches. It takes some work. It takes some getting out of our comfort zone at times, and especially when you're up against the clock and it's even with the time constraints. But I'm telling you, man, these things make the difference in a guy and guys – not only learning stuff, but like getting, uh, developing a culture in your room of learning and guys uh, developing in, in that uh, aspect. So those are, those are my core daily meeting room things. Okay, here, how's this looking? Did it show up? Yeah, it shows up. Just, uh, right. just small writing, that's all. So here's, I can't take credit for this. I think he's on, on here. 
my man Caleb Hanks, he's a uh, receivers coach at Stony Brook, but he was a GA for us at Rice um, when I was there. He, he actually started doing this with his receivers. He used to sit next to me and I saw it. I was like, man, I like this. I want to start uh, utilizing this, um, this, these film study notes to give to our players when they arrive at the, to the meetings. Now, I will. I gave him his credit, but I know he. I took it to another level. Though I know he ain't on this level now. So I gave him his love, but if he's watching, he, I'm gonna let him know he ain't on my level anymore. I took it. Took it and ran with it. But uh, the film study notes. That there's multiple things that I think you get out of this. Um, I'll kind of break it down. So um, the culture, the, the, the cultural things I want to have in my room. I'm double doubling down with the, with the criteria for their grading. What I didn't like as a player is when you came back from a game and the coach was like, hey, you got an 82% for the game. And I'm like, how, how can you even critique? How can you give me an 82%? Like, th there's there's no criteria for it. Oh, well, you, you know, you uh, you were slow on the backside on this play and this and that. Like, no, to me, I feel like I'm being cheated out of my grade. Like, I want to see the criteria, exactly how it calculated up. And so that's kind of why I got to this. But so. You'll see on this diagram, we got the play name right here. Then we got the player. Then we got the, uh, so I grade them on their tracks. The track in the run game is the most important thing than anything. Uh, if, you say, if you're 100% on your track, then you're going to have a chance to have success, especially when the line blocks it correctly. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I grade them on their track on every run and their finish on every single play. And that these two things are going back to that acronym, that RB's acronym, the standards. So you can don't get me wrong, you can have success on a play with not a perfect track, but we want we want to have success and have a perfect track um, because we we're going to guarantee ourselves a chance for success when we do that. My criteria for finish is if we have the ball in our hands um, in practice, we don't it's, it's we didn't fall on the ground. Or we didn't run right down the middle of a guy and let him thud us up. So we picked the side, kept our feet moving. If we were playing live, that would have meant that we had a chance for yards over contact. So if they if they fall on the ground and practice at all with the ball in their hand, I give them a minus. Um, if you don't burst after contact, that's a minus on your finish. Um, so those are on the ball things um, that you can get a plus or a minus for. Without the ball and pass pro, if if you're if you don't finish blocking your guy. Um, until the ball is thrown, that's a minus. Um, and, and the counter of that would be if he does finish with his guy right, riding out of the picture and the ball is thrown, you get a plus on that. Um, if, the, if we're running a swing route and the quarterback throws it, you know, it throws a curl to the field, we need to be running over there and getting in that and working our way to the ball for in the, in the event of a fumble or we may be that extra block that, that is needed to get to the, to the end zone. And so um, – and or if we're blocking downfield, the last last but not least, if we're blocking downfield, we need to finish blocking our guy when that whistle's blown, uh, or at least working to somebody when the whistle's blown. And so those that's my criteria for a positive or a negative um, on the track and the finish. I'll have over here my notes um, for each play. So like Sam right here, he got minus on his track, minus on his finish. So hey, too tight on your track, you got to get your eyes to the, on the four eye. Um, so I'll have little notes. Sometimes they do it right. Sometimes you don't have to have them. Um, and it's not always negative. Like right here, uh, Ty, um, sprint, we ran sprint left. He had a positive on the finish. And I said, hey, good job getting to the line fast. He struggled getting to the line. That was something that we, I was continue to enforce on a day-to-day -day basis that he was still working through. He made a breakthrough. He, he got a plus on it. And I wanted to emphasize the reason why he got that plus and what we've been working on is you did a good job getting to the line fast. That was what led to your success on that play. Okay, so that's kind of the criteria and the different guys. Everybody's, you know, I'm charging everybody. And down here at the bottom is, is what I really love. Um, they get the grade. So I tally it all up. You get a grade. Uh, Sam got a 10 out of 10 on his track, 100%. His finish, he was 14 out of uh, 17 with an 82%. And then I'm always over here for the positive. Um, and something that they need to work on, something they basically got, they did a good job or got better in that day that we've been talking about, or something something that they need to work on moving forward. Um, and so this is right in the, the meeting before we go out to practice. And I like having this tool to kind of trigger their mind. All right, man, coach said I did a good job on my tracks yesterday. Let me keep doing good on my tracks. 
coach said I need to work on getting my hands inside and pass through. All right, that's what I'm focusing on. And so um, I like to have a positive and, a, and something they can work on. Uh, right here, I said, great pride, get great job taking pride in your tracks. We got a team out of 10. And then I said, keep focusing on covering the ball with two hands in traffic. Okay, nothing major, um, nothing earth shattering. But once again, it's just a daily emphasis of having a high standard for, for what you put on film, as well as um, just taking pride and doing the little things that are going to take uh, to have success as a running back. And so those, those are things. Um, that I love. So that's just on the surface. They get to see, they get to track their progress individually. The thing that I like, and somebody asked this, uh, uh, I think Coach Jones asked me this uh, on Twitter, how he said, let me write, I wrote the question down. He says, um, if you have an RB battle, how do you, how do you do, you know, your playing time? The, since I started doing this like four or five years ago, I really haven't had to have depth chart meetings um, and things like that because they get this criteria daily. They see what's going on daily on this picture. That's why I like having, I don't give every single person their own individual grades. I want everybody to see every, I want Tyson right here to know, man, I only had 83, Sam Stewart had 100%. I need to shut my butt up in my tracks or I can understand why coach won't have confidence in me in the right hand. Or, you know, my boy Matt down here, he had 62 on his finish. That means you, you're, you're either – your practice habits aren't great or you just – you're not quite there yet. And so, to me, that this usually takes care of the and alleviates the question marks of who, you know, who, who's the guy in the room, who's the most consistent in the room. Um, and some of it is ability-based. Like, you know, Ty, on the surface, he's probably a little bit more talented than something. He is. And so – and his grades aren't too bad. He's an 83 and a 92. I can, I can justify that. Him still being a starter, but if, if Ty was down here at 52 and then at 35, it, I'm that's that's not a good culture. I'm setting that for And so on, on the other end, as a coach, you got to keep that in mind as well. But um, that's just the atmosphere that we create. It's a competitive atmosphere. They're looking at each other's foot. Man, I freaking let this dude be by one percent. I need to step my game up, and then we're we're uh, encouraging and still correcting. These, it's, this just covers a multitude of things that I really believe in as a coach. And once again, it's just a standard of, of excellence as well as creating an atmosphere of learning day, on a daily basis and not getting complacent. That's what these, each individual coaching points um, are for right here. We coach, still got good. A, coach got a question for you here. Uh, yep. Coach wants to know, do you grade indie drills as well or just team drills? I, I, only, I only grade team drills um, – I don't even grade. I don't even grade skilling. I only grade team because I don't want. I don't want to saturate it as well. You know what I mean. I don't want. I don't want. Um, you know, guys having too much, too much information in front of them. And then you know, we go through seven on seven. There's not going to be many minuses on seven on seven. You know what I mean. It's it's kind of hard to get a minus on that. Um, and so it's going to saturate the, the the scores a little bit. Um, but the one thing I do on a day to day basis is film indie group. We may not even watch them like as a group, but when they push it to their iPads, they see that it's been filmed. They don't know honestly that I watch it or not, but I like creating it. I like sometimes I might go pull a clip like, hey, dude, you're sitting here wondering why you're not being able to pick this guy up in the past. Well, look at you in the indie group like it's, and break it down that way. Um, but um, I film everything, but I don't, I don't, I never really even watch Skelly or anything unless there's something that, that pops up like, in Skelly, if um, if we put in a, a wheel route this week and we're, we emphasize a lot of Skelly and I we didn't run in a lot of team periods, I'll pull some of those clips and watch them as a group just to have a higher sample size. But I only grade those because because really um, I just want to really emphasize the tracks and the finish, um, and so that's why I try to keep it at a little bit smaller of a sample size. And it was also asked uh, if you if you show them every single clip or just choose a couple. Of the whole of the team period, yes, sir. I personally like showing everything if I have the time. Um, sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll go through it a little bit faster. Like, but hey, good job right here. And buzz through and just get to the one. Like, if we had a unit meeting before and we just were strapped at the time, there's times. But I usually try. That's another reason why I don't watch watch Skelly 
most of the time is because of that. Um, and unless there's something that just, we just blew, we just kept messing up and do Skelly and I had to pull it up to, uh, you know, emphasize it. Uh, but I try to, I try to keep it at the meat and potato, meat and potatoes of it. I want to, I want to show as much real football as, as we're, as a running backs coach. If, if I was a receivers coach, quarterbacks coach, all that stuff honestly does have value. But for me, in my experience as a running backs coach, I need to, I need to stick to what's most valuable for those guys to learn from. Um, and so I do like watching every clip because I think the way I teach my guys, they sometimes they learn even more from the rep, the other guys' rep than their their own rep um, at times as well. So that's kind of my philosophy. Sure. And uh, how much are Mr. How much are Mr. Simons weighed into their grades? So yeah, the MA. So I didn't have any on here, but instead of a minus on finish, I put MA and put it in red too. Luckily, I've been blessed to not to not have a lot of MAs because of these different techniques that I use um, with our learning style or our, uh, engaged learning and meeting, just forcing those guys to really learn their responsibilities. We'll get them every now and then, and I just put them in big, put big old red right here instead of a minus to let them know, like, hey, the other thing I do is, like, if, if the ball security was atrocious or if, uh, if let's just say, they actually put the ball on the ground, I put it up to do that ball security. So it's automatic. They know it's a minus for sure. Uh, but if it's a ball security issue, I'm going to put that in red too. And it's, it's that's counted as a minus. But I just want to emphasize, like, this is an absolute no-no. This is not – it's okay to make some mistakes. Like, it's, it's not the end of the world if you get a minus on, the, on, on your track or anything as long as you're working for it. But there's some absolute knots that you got to have as a running back and as ball security and MAs. So that, that's kind of how I feel about it. Good coach. Anymore? We're good. Okay. So we talked about um, just playing time, how I think this sorts out the playing time, um, the position meeting structure and things like that. Um, let's see. So here's one more, one little last thing that I'll show you um, here. Let's see if it works. Let's see. One second. I didn't bring my house with me, so it's hard to navigate the screen. Uh, there we go. Uh, it froze. Oh, there it is. It, it, um, it froze, but I just had a, um, it was an example of some of my daily notes um, that I use with my guys uh, and those type of things. Just, just how I hand it to them um, in a note fashion. It's nothing, nothing really earth shattering, honestly. Um, the other good question that I had, can, can you hear me right now, Justin? Yes, sir. Um, the, there's another good question that I, I'll cover real quick before we uh, switch over to some film is uh, somebody asked me, what are we current, what am I currently doing during this time where we're doing, uh, we're working from home and staying in contact with my players. Uh, I think it's pretty much the same as everybody else. Um, we're having Zoom, we do Zoom meetings. Uh, we actually had our first Zoom position meeting yesterday, uh, but we, I've been in constant contact with them. I actually uh, didn't use Zoom for my position meeting. I used uh, just a all my guys had iPhones, so I just FaceTimed them and then held it up to the screen. Um, held it, and I just watched like a four or five play cut up of uh, the last practice that we had before we before we came on spring break um, that we had still hadn't gotten to watch yet. I didn't want to overdo it. I mean, right now it's it's a weird time for these kids. In my opinion, they got they're doing a ton of work from home, which uh, they most of them aren't used to. They're used to actually physically going to class. So we're staying on top of those guys really heavy, heavy about the academic part. Um, they're trying to get workouts in. And it's just it's a, it's a life-changing experience for those guys. We think of it as our from our perspective as coaches, but 
Um, so we, we got on, on FaceTime for about 15, 20 minutes. I just really got to, I'm just now getting to Arizona. So um, I'm still really emphasizing these tracks and uh, the, just the, the standards that we talk about, um, our finish and just different ways that we got to get better in the run game. And so those are things that we, uh, we really honed in. So I just picked about four or five plays and really got to the, to the, to the nitty gritty on each and every one of them, slowed it down, coached it, every little aspect of it up. And then um, I felt like it was productive and our guys were engaged. So I, I didn't want them holding their phone for 45 you know, minutes, hour, and things like that. I wanted them to get, you know, get a good, get a good, uh, you know, feel for, for where I was coming from. And then the other thing is like, we don't know how long this thing's gonna go. I think the main thing right now with, our, with players in general is let's just keep on, <laughs> keep reminding them that you're a football player. Like, it's easy for them. I mean, we got different things. We're recruiting and doing stuff like that. But college athletes, high school athletes, they're just sitting around the house trying to figure out what the heck to do. They're upset because they can't go see their girlfriend and stuff like that. So we just want to remind them more so than anything, like, hey, you're still a football player. And just keep them, keep them triggered, keep them in the thought process of learning football. And because and, uh, at some point we're going to be back doing this thing. And so it's easy for us. We get paid to do this, to stay engaged and to be locked in and ready to roll when this thing is rolling again. I think our job as coaches right now is just to make sure we, we don't overdo it. We'll lose overkill when they got all these things going on. Still keep it triggered and engaged as well. So that's kind of my personal philosophy on that to answer that question. Okay. Were there any other that came up while I was talking? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as a younger coach and also a new coach, uh, how would you like integrate yourself into the staff and establish yourself in the position room? <clears throat> so um, integrating into the staff, I would say um, just like from my perspective, I'm, I'm the running backs coach. So I'm, I'm more so just there to soak everything in. I don't want to come across as, you know, here's the guy that think, you know, he invented football. Um, you know, I really want to develop genuine relationships with my coworkers and, you know, take time to get to know them. Like, hey, you know, you got kids, you got what's your family like and, and where are you from? You know, I think that's, that part is, is an invaluable, you know, to have in that, that first little window of time that you're there and just showing guys that who, who you really are as a person and just the things that are deeper than football. And I think that's important because uh, the football, I mean, you're, you're around each other all the time and we're at work and doing football. So the football part is going to come, but I think the genuine uh, get to know you part is, is very important um, when you do have that time. And I think with the players, the same way, um, I met with each each and every one of them within the first couple of days. Face, I actually, because I, I got the job on a, I want to say Friday, got their numbers. I think Saturday and Sunday, I FaceTimed them um, as many as I could. I talked to them on the phone, just introduced myself, and uh, I thought that was really good. Just setting setting the tone that hey, this this guy didn't just he didn't just come here to coach football, but he had a genuine interest in me as a person. And so um, <clears throat> even now during this time, I, I've We've had our, our group FaceTime, but I've also had my individual FaceTime because really I've, I've been here for a month. I'm still really getting to know these guys. Um, and then one thing that I started doing last year at BYU that I thought was, it took some time um, out of our meeting. It took five minutes, sometimes even 10 minutes, but something that really I thought brought my players closer together and as well as uh, kind of uh, tighten our relationship that we had as well is to start every meeting, I would have, I would do, I, I call it two by two. And I would pick, we, I would just randomly pick a guy in the room for every, for each and every one of us collectively, collectively to ask two questions. So not every single person asks two questions to that person, but uh, as a group, we ask that person two questions. So it could be anything. It could be, hey, what's your favorite ice cream? It could be, hey, who's your mentor? Like, who, uh, do you have a girlfriend? It could be that. And so we'll ask one person two questions, and then we'll ask another person two questions. And then at the end of that, we'll ask, I'll always give them a chance to ask me two questions. And, you know, sometimes it's serious, but, hey, coach, when did uh, when did you know your wife was the one? Or, hey, coach, um, what's your favorite food to eat? Or, hey, what do you like to do outside of work? And just sometimes we laughed and it was fun, but sometimes it was, it was serious and it was just a good opportunity for those guys to see 
um, just another side of me as a coach to learn me a little bit more and to me to learn some new things about them um, and, and things like that. And I just really thought it helped the culture of our room. I thought that the guys played harder um, for one another. And I, I guess for me, because they knew me a little bit more and things like that. So I've done that to start here at Arizona. I think that's been really good. I, they get a kick out of it, actually. I think we've done it twice, maybe two, two or three times since I've been here. And uh, the guys here like it too. So it's, it's probably something I'll roll with for the rest of my career. Um, and it's, I, I don't think the guy, they don't mind because that's kind of, but they expect us to just come in and just get straight to, all right, here's the film. Like when they first just sit down in their seats, I think it, it's a breath of fresh air for them. It's a, like for you to sit back for five minutes and just get down to the core foundation um, and, and build a relationship more, more so with the guys. And sometimes just you need to laugh and, and and have a couple, you know, have a couple of jokes before you get rolling. They kind of set the tone for the energy in your media. Today. So those are some uh, some other things that have helped me. Anything else? Uh, well, just since you were talking about uh, the players being home, do you have a specific drill that you feel comfortable with uh, them doing on their own at home? Comfortable, comfortable doing on their own? Yeah, at home. Um. I mean, it'll be hard to do most of our things. I'll pull it up here, you'll see why, but um, I'm, I'm good with them just doing anything that they know is, is going to help them as a running back, as far as whether it be Cooper, um, any of that. I always mess with my guys about, like, when they're in the offseason, because they'll ask me, like, hey, coach, what should I do? I'm like, hey, you need to be working. Don't be doing all that cool work, really. Let's do some freaking pass pro. Go get some hand shields and, like, go work pass pro. Like, and they laugh about it because, I mean, we see all the internet videos and dudes like going, jumping through hula hoops and freaking jumping around cones and all that. And so I just like challenge them like, hey, why don't you put a video out of you working some freaking pass for drills over the week, you know, over the weekend or something. Like, I was like, you'll go viral if you do that. So they kind of laugh about that. But I think they, um, I'm just fine with them doing anything right now. Like, to me, the, it, it's just more so just not laying around sit on the couch all day. I mean, this is going to be hard for them to just go to a park and simulate some of the things that they would do with our with my type of drill work that I do. Um, um, but they, they just kind of, they kind of understand, like, as long as they're, they're doing something um, and using the technique as far as their feet and all of that, if they are working through their run game tracks or something like that on their own, then I'm fine with it. I just, I, I, I'm a fan of them just doing something and not sitting around just on the phone with a girl all day and, and on FaceTime, you know what I mean? So that's that's kind of my philosophy on it. Good. Is that it? Yeah, we're good. All right. I'm going to pull up real quick. Let's talk. Um, how much time do I have? You're good, Coach. Do your thing. All right. Let's go. Um, let's go. Let's go tight zone real quick. And then we can we get some time at the end. I can cover a couple. I got like two or three ball security drills that I think are not everybody does, but I think are really good uh, drills. Um, but we'll start off right here with a uh, tight zone. Um, some people call it inside zone. I was just talking to who was I talking to? I talked to a, a handful of running back coaches this week, but uh, he was asking me, "Hey, coach, what do you do on the inside zone?" Um, and he was telling me how, how he ran it just with his uh, aim and point with the butt of the center. And that's that's how I've run it the last two years. And, yeah, it's technically inside zone, but I like to use the term tight zone um, because I think it it creates a, in a, a mindset of downhill, a little bit more downhill. Um, and and it's, to me, that's just a better way um, to verbalize what we're trying to get out of. Now, if you're going across the mesh, like if I'm lined up on the left and I'm going to the right, Foot of the or the play side foot of the center or you know inside leg of the guard, which I've done. I'm okay with calling that inside zone. Um, but if you're truly trying to get downhill, I like call I like referring to that as tight zone, not inside zone. Um, not to say that it's wrong or the way I say it is right, but I think that's uh, that's really important. Um, right here, so I'm gonna show us like some drill work. The guys that have seen me post Glazer, been at Glazer Clinic, you can log off right now if you want. This is I've shown this probably 50 times, I feel like, in the last year. Um, but I believe in it. I trust it. 
um, as a coach, and I've seen it have success with the drill work as well as the coaching part. And so um, this is what I'm, I'm going to talk uh, right here. Um, so somebody asked another question was, how do you maximize your time in your individual drills? And I just started doing this a couple of years ago is because it, it seems like every year I, I get less and less individual time as, as, it go, as I've gone in my career. So I used to feel like I had like 30 minutes when I first started back in 2013 or 2012. And now it's like, I only feel like I only get like seven minutes to get a lot of stuff done. And so I try to be as, as much all inclusive with my drill work as possible. I want to work multiple things. I never want to just like I'm work like this drill, you'll see we're actually working footwork, but there's so many different components attached to that drill. There's, um, we're working on our track, stand on our track in the run game. We're working on staying vertical when we do make a cut and we're also we're working on pressing, pressing the heels. We're basically getting a live simulation of, of running a, a tight zone play. Um, the other way that this, this drill is beneficial, this drill structure is beneficial to me is my four string guy during the season, he's not going to get very many reps against the scout team when we go team period. And so to me, I like using this, these simulations because I feel like I'm still in a rep for that guy on his track, on his, um, you know, the different intricacies of running tight zone. Um, and so that's why I believe in this. So this, this uh, we got wide back to vertical. Um, I call it wind back instead of cut back because I want them to feel like they got pressed. I, it's just another terminology thing. When they think cut back, to me, when I hear cut back, I think I'm going to take the ball and I'm going to be two yards behind the line of scrimmage to just cut and get go back. Now that linebacker's thrown over the top, and he just made the tackle. And so I'm, I'm big on a stickler on using terms that it's saying the same thing, but it's creating a, a mindset with the running backs of attention to detail. And so I say wind back instead of cut back. Um, so we're pressing, so we're focusing on pressing the heels to the vertical seam. We're working on track. It promotes finding the vertical seam, which I'll talk about, and then emphasizes the importance of getting back vertical after you make a turn. That's the number one thing you'll see on this film that I, I'll show, to give you some examples of guys that I've coached. When they first get to me from high school, these guys, they've been used to playing where they just take the ball make their first read and just bounce it and outrun everybody on the defense, which I wish you could do that at our level, but I haven't played very many teams, uh, Division One teams, where it, or had a guy that could just take the ball and just go and circle the field on any given opponent. And so I'm huge on vert being vertical in the run game, no matter what the run game is. Any aspect, any running game scheme that we have in our offense, the main objective is to get vertical. So this, you'll see here how it emphasizes that. Um, we'll get, I'll get it. Get it going. So here's the drill. Can you see it, Justin? Yes, sir. You're good. So right here is this. Uh, these are these are the linemen right here. These uh, agiles. They represent the linemen. So here, the middle bag is the center. Then we got the guard, the tackle, um, then the guard, the tackle. I'm uh, simulating those blocks occurring. So I do different things with this. It's not necessarily that's the exact way that the line going to look. I want them to have awareness with their feet at all times. And so I'll mess around with the structure of this drill and force them to really understand I'm making my read, but I still have I still have to have my eyes up and, and be able to navigate through traffic with my feet as I'm working on trying to find a vertical uh, situation for myself. And so um, once again, going back to my previous uh, statement, earlier in my career, 2012 through probably 14, I would just do the old school L drill with my running backs to work on footwork. And so, yeah, that's focusing on having spatial awareness with your feet and sorting things out with your eyes up. But that's just one, you're working one technique in that drill. And so that's once, if, to answer the previous question, if they wanted to go out right now on their own and do L drill, 100% I would love for them to do that because they are working on footwork. When they're with me, I don't have time with my seven minutes to only work on footwork. So I want to add different components. So we're working on our, our footwork right here, getting to the mesh. We're working on pressing the heels vertically on our track and then also sorting it up out with our feet. And so you'll see here, he's, he's pressing it. I'm emphasizing all those, all those things we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. Get square at the mesh, press the heels, jump cut, and then find you. And what I want them to do, I want them to jump cut to find the vertical seam. I don't want us to jump to bounce. 
I want us to jump to be vertical. And so when I say that, I mean, we should still have our shoulders square on our jump cut. And that's why I use the term wind back. It's a wind back, meaning that our shoulders are square and we're just winding behind traffic to get back vertical instead of actually jumping and then going and bouncing it out this way right here. Okay. So you'll see it'll keep going back and forth between the drill and the film. Okay. So let's talk about how, we, how we're going to read it. Um, we were a little bit wider um, at BYU um, as far as our, our landmark with the near leg of the center on tight zone. We're reading the nose um, in, a, in an eye front. He'll tell us where to go right here. This is kind of a gray area read. I uh, hope, uh, hope Coach Mateo from BYU is not on, on this, getting mad at me for saying it's a gray area read. But it's a tough, it's, they got a weird looking front right here. Okay, so. The biggest thing, the one thing I think he could have done is I thought, I always tell my running backs, if nothing takes you off your track, let's stay vertical. He he should know that he's going to make this cut, but I want him to try to sell it one more step to make this linebacker feel like he has to hold uh, to, to stay front side of the play. And so that's one thing he could have done better. You see, he's he's pre, he's kind of predetermined in his cut a little bit. Not egregious. But if, if I'm coaching him up off film, I want – that's something I'm emphasizing with him because he's already a little bit further down the line with his, with his understanding of the game of football. He can take that little detail of pressing it one more before he makes it cut. Okay. Now, the, the uh, other thing, I always say I want you to read. You, in the eye front, you're going to read the nose guard to the first vertical seam. And what I mean by that, a vertical seam is a, a, a clean block where we see a guy's butt – or his hip. And so right here, I wouldn't consider this a vertical seam because this guy is about to attach himself to that guy. This right here would be a vertical seam because we see the butt. He's got that block sustained. And we want to hug that thing as tight as we can so that we can avoid uh, this guy coming off his block and making a tackle. There's sometimes that there's not going to be as much space. We got to hug this thing so we can create. I always use the term, let's create it on tackle because we hug this block as tight as we can. Um, and then also by hugging this, we keep ourselves away from this backside trap. Okay, so right here, what you'll see, okay, he doesn't do a great job of that. Now, all the guys that coach receivers, I know you use that term. Um, like I know some receivers coaches that say they tell our guys on a curl route to run at 14, knowing that they're going to get to 12. Um, you know, but they don't say 12 because then they're going to freaking be breaking it down at nine or 10. And so as a running backs coach. In a perfect world, I'd love for that guy to be right here on this hip. We wouldn't even get an arm tackle right here. We'd keep ourselves away from this backer. But he, he understands it enough to be close to that. We still get a semi-arm tackle. We really do get an arm tackle. He may not even have been able to slow our progress down. Um, but I'm, I'm saying that to say that some of these coaching points, you want to expect, you want to uh, strive for perfection, but settle for next. And so I think he's doing a good job. He put himself – in a good in a good situation to be able to have yards out of contact, and then he does a good job finishing the run and getting extra yards out of contact. That's something else we'll, we'll work on um, as well. Okay, here's another angle at it. Okay, just once again emphasizing our hey our track is on the near leg of the center. Okay, we want to press that thing to the heels while we're making a read, and then we want to hug that vertical seam as tight as possible. And so that's why I use this bag right. To understand, there's a guy flash. I'm gonna hug the first vertical seam as hard as 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 tight as I can, so that I can create space uh, between me and the defender. The other reason I like to use these agiles right here is the going back to coaching freshmen. They're used to in in a, in a high school game seeing so much space when they whenever they do make their decision. At this level, man, this may be this right here. Though, huge cavern for a running back at this level. Sometimes it's going to be even tighter than that, and you, they got to be satisfied with taking a vertical opportunity when, when it presents itself. And I always tell them sometimes you just got to get the ugly three or the ugly four. Um, so I don't want them searching for answers, looking for huge gashes in the defense when they, they're not going to provide, they're not going to prevent themselves at the time. And so that's the, I like to use these agiles as well to have them create that sense of, hey, that's enough for me to get to the, towards the end zone or get vertical. And so uh, that's a, the other reason why I like to use those ad jobs to emphasize that coaching. Um, just a little backstory on uh, number five right here. He came from, from uh, South Carolina, grad transfer for me. 
special, really talented running back. And when he first got to me, he did some things naturally. I was like, man, I'm not going to mess the dude up. I just got to let him play. I'm not going to overcoach him. But he bounced stuff a lot of times when he could have just stayed vertical and made his life a lot easier where he didn't have to barrel over to safety to make an ugly four yards out of contact. And he, he was just missing vertical opportunities because he was trying to just circle the defense almost, just like a high school kid. And so this run right here, this is the first I, he, we had him for a camp for whatever, however long you get, 15 practices in camp. And this is the first game of the season last year. But I, I put this on there. It's not the prettiest clip, but it, it doubled down in my mind in the coaching points. Even though he's a great player, these coaching points work. And what I mean by that, that he found the first vertical opportunity. And right here, he wants to just bounce it and go. I know it and just knowing this kid, if, he, if it were three weeks ago, he would have just taken it and gone out here and got a tackle by the safety net for sure. What he did right here is once he found a vertical seam, once again, the vertical seam right here is tight end. Okay, it was muddy, muddy, muddy. Now this is the vertical opportunity. Once he saw that, he knew this was the quickest way to get to where I need to get to. And he puts that flip ground right there. Okay, and he makes, <laughs> he makes that linebacker miss. And then he is up right here. This is why I said I didn't want to overcoach him because he watched this dude does some special stuff. That's like three NFL guys that he just made look silly on that play. But the coaching point, the reason why I keep this on here and it's not the prettiest is it doubles down on all the reasons why I love that drill and I think it's, it works is because, okay, we made our read. Okay, they're in, um, right here. They're in even front. So we're going to read this, uh, this uh, three technique right here. Okay. He crosses our face, so we want to stay vertical. Now we're looking at this gap, okay? Not this, it's closing up. This guy's hat showing, so now we're the, we're the first vertical scene. There it is. Probably could have been even a little tighter off of it, but he knows, and coach is going to get me if I just take this ball and go run straight to that safety right now. He does it, and he ends up having success right there. And so that's, that's kind of a more of a testimonial clip as a coach that I love to show um, when it comes to tight zone. This is a lot, I'll go through one more right here. Okay, just one more angle. Okay, as you see, they're getting a live, a live rep of what they're going to have in the game. And then once again, they got to get comfortable with hugging blocks, having good spatial awareness, trusting that this is enough space for me to have success on any given run through. And so that's why I like to use that. And it's, it's just doubling down. Here's a, as a, this is a weird clip to show this. You got to be a real running backs coach to appreciate this clip right here. This is the prettiest four yard game I've ever seen in my whole life. I want, to see, I want you to see this right here. I'm going to let it play, and then I'll go back. But look at this. is That's a beautiful – this is like top five runs in my whole coaching career that I've seen from a guy. And it, I say it from a nerdy running back coach perspective, but let's just really break it down right here. Okay, so they're in the eye front. We're reading the nose guard. Okay, he goes away. Now, so you see the difference between what he did on this clip and then what number five did on that first clip where I said he kind of predetermined. He didn't press it. He didn't fully sell it and give himself a chance to maximize an on tackle. He, this guy is going to do everything by the book. He's almost robotic at, at times, but he's going to do every any, – any coaching point you give him, he's going to do it by the book. And he does a great job right here being vertical. That one more step vertically with his shoulders kept that guy front side and allowed that block to come off. And then the vertical – he read the nose guard to the first vertical seam. You see that butt right there on the center. He does a great job. I mean, that's literally as great as you can get right there as far as hugging the scene. And the reason why we do that, we want to create an arm tackle, make it put pressure on this guy that's showing up in the picture. He does a great job right there. And then these are the secondary coaching points, getting skinny on contact, eyes up, running off feet. Those are different things, different secondary coaching points. But just that's just from a from a fundamental standpoint, man, versus a great defense. These guys are like fourth in the country and run defense. I mean, every yard matters against these dudes for us to have a chance in the running game. And he he just did a great job, man. I was I, I love this clip. I mean, that's that's as good of a four yard run as you're gonna see. Most guys that I've seen in my coaching career watching film on other people or um, just not or or just uh, watching even my guys when they're younger, he'll just take this ball and just try to throw it up in here and he gets tackled for one yard or he bends this thing. He cuts it back, like I said, instead of winding back, and now he makes this guy just freaking lifts us up, dunks us down for no gain, one yard gain, maybe if we're lucky. But this guy does everything by the book, gets skinny. That's a beautiful play right there.
Okay. And then here we'll go one more right here. Once again, so here is just once we've kind of mastered just pressing heels, getting getting back vertical, then I like to add this element where I just move this bag real quick, just really focus and making them focus on keeping their feet in the position at all times to have success. I always tell running backs, you got to be able to react to chaos in football. If you don't have great power level and your feet are in a successful position um, or in the inside of a box in an athletic position, then you're not going to be able to react to the chaos and the things that come that happen off script in the game of football. And so that's why I'm using that bag right there, just switching it up. We've already done good with me just moving this and I'm hugging that thing vertical. But then the other part is it also emphasizes, okay, we need to get to the C gap, but then once we get to the C gap, we'll be right back vertical. And so instead of it's a little thing, but it's a big thing, we're not drifting all the way out here out the picture. We should be avoiding and then getting right back vertical. So that's what we're working on. Uh, the muscle memory of that on that play. And you'll see uh, here where it shows up. Okay, so we're reading the, uh, this three technique right here to our side. Okay, does a great job hugging it, pressing it tight. Okay, guys are falling off blocks. Once again, I hope my, my man uh, Mateo from BYU is not watching. I'm not trying to hate on you. I'm just trying to coach this play up. And he does a good job, and I want you to see this is the benefit of staying vertical and pressing, staying on your track until something takes you off and pressing heels. Is this. Look at the bind that it puts on this, this edge uh, C gap defender right here. Okay, he's reading the quarterback, and now he has no chance of making that tackle right now because we did we stayed on our track, pressed the heels, and then we kept our shoulders square and gave ourselves a chance post match to be able to make this cut and get him. He does a great job, and then once again, you know, the coaching point, once you get there, get right back vertical, you see that, and we have a successful play right there against a really good defense. Okay? We have any questions on uh, tight zone? I know it wasn't a lot of clips. I have more clips, but I don't want to bore y'all with a ton of you know, tight zone clips. Yeah, a coach asked if you prefer running tight zone to a shade or a three. <sighs> to me, uh, <laughs> to me, it doesn't really matter as long as, I mean, if they, can, if they can block it. I've been lucky, like, when I was at BYU, when we ran this a lot, we, our line was really good. You know, we knocked guys off the ball, and so we had success. But um, I don't really like it against the eye front as much because at times that that center, just like you saw in that first clip with, against Tennessee where it was kind of a gray area read, if you don't have a center that can go get it, and even really good center, it's hard to really, like, go mano a mano with that guy and give it a clear, give a clear picture for the running back to make his read and accordingly. Um, and so the, I, that's one, one thing I'll say, like, against an eye front, sometimes there can be some some things that come up if, if you're going against – if they're just better than you up front, I think that it, it puts you in a little bit of a bind um, right there on that, especially if you're not doing things to maybe read with the quarterback and just at least slow the defense down a little bit in, in their thought process. But um, – even front, as long as we <laughs> take care of it, that's – I don't really uh, – I've never really worried about that from a running back coach perspective. Um, I, I like it against an even front, whether it's a three or a shade, because I think I think the running backs can sort it, off, sort it out as long as we get vertical movement. Good, Coach. That's it for Tyson? Yes, sir. All right, cool. Um, I'll finish off with just some, uh, some ball security – are just kind of some miscellaneous drills that I like. Uh, once again, I'll talk. If, if you guys come come uh, next next Friday, my Glazier, my online uh, Glazier clinic, I'm going to talk more wide zone, and I'm going to talk uh, pass pro. So we'll get to that. I want to uh, talk a couple of things about – it'll have some film here too, so it'll, it'll be like double E. But real quick, just uh, some people ask me about ball security as well. So I wanted to make sure I covered that. Um, <clears throat> pull it up real quick. Okay, I talked about this a little bit at the um, where was that? At the AFCA convention for the guys that came talk ball security. The thing, I mean, I, we all coach high and tight and all that. The the one as far as having the ball in one hand thing that I coach that may be a little bit different as far as the way I turn it. I tell my guys to not only have the ball high and tight, but tuck the elbow. 
because what teams, what guys are really good at now on defense is the deal where they come through and punch at the ball. And when the ball can be high and tight, but there's so much more, there's room for error right here. They get the, they punch in the right area. Now I'll say this, it's hard to get the ball from behind when they punch up at it. So the high and tight is, that works. But I think you, you, you have success in either situation if you tuck the elbow. Because now when they punch down on the ball, they're punching back into your framework as well as they can't see the ball. But now they can't even see the ball from behind and try to uh, punch it out from behind either. So I think that's the best of both worlds. Something that I don't hear every coach coaching. Not even saying that it's the right thing, honestly, as a coach to um, – that, that I coach it that way, but it's something that has allowed me to have success in my room and not put the ball on the ground. And it gives me criteria to coach it and reemphasize it on a day-to-day -day basis. What I tell my guys on when we watch film or if we're standing behind in practice, if I can see the football from when I'm standing from behind you, if we're watching a book copy of film, then it's, you can have better ball security. Meaning that, that that elbow is not tucked as tight, you're not keeping everything in your framework as tight as you can if that if your elbow is out and I can see the football from behind. So that's this base, basic way for me to evaluate the success or failure of a boss at any given ball security without it actually going on the ground um, and try to prevent those things. Um, as far as covering the ball in, uh, in traffic, um, I call this is a drill um, I call Zeke drill. I got it from Ezekiel Elliott. Notice, like, back when, even when he was at Ohio State, anytime he got in traffic, he got skinny, not only tucking the elbow, but he covers the ball. Um, right right now in Arizona, I got my man Coach Mazzoni. We kind of collab. I always call it grab the wrist. Um, but Coach Mazzoni said, hey, let's, let's uh, call it grabbing the watch. And I like that a lot. So I had to put my pride aside because his idea was better than mine. And uh, I just said, hey, let's grab the watch. Um, that's something that we're bringing to the, uh, to the forefront with our skill players now, Arizona. Grab the watch. And so being a grab, you know, grab that wrist area, get skinny. The things that the reason why I like calling the Z drill, not only does he never doesn't really put the ball on the ground, he always gets yards after contact. Um, if you see, he lead, he's always top five in the NFL yards after contact because he's always skinny. His eyes are always up on contact, and he's falling forward every single time. The old school way of covering the ball with two hands it promotes to me it promotes putting your eyes down. Once your eyes go down, first it's a safety issue. You know, you the helmet to helmet. And also, once once you can't see who's going to hit you, there's no way you're going to be able to navigate that and fall forward to get extra yards. And so not only is it a ball security thing, to me it's just a, a mentality of fighting for every single yard that we can possibly get, and it's promoting uh, those little things. So um, the focus, the main focus of this drill is two hands in traffic and yards of contact. It promotes keeping eyes up on contact, forces you to have good power and it reinforces getting skinny at the point of contact, getting skinny. Okay, once again, old school way of covering it with two, that's a wide framework. I cover that thing, grab the watch right here. I'm, I'm a lot skinnier, so I'm a lot more aerodynamic in tight spaces. I got a chance to maybe squeeze through there and have success. And so you'll see here, this is uh, my man, uh, Harv. He's the uh, BYU running backs coach now. Uh, he worked with me the last two years. So this is us. We just holding holding the hand shields, and I don't. I, I'm a big proponent in the drill work. I don't want to like just keep killing you with my drill work. Like right here, this is like a five yard drill, but it's just emphasizing the thing that I'm trying to get a, get a conference right here. Uh, we use it where you got the ball the uh, the ball coverings right here, the satin ball coverings to just really force them to have to grip that thing tight in order for uh, them to have success um, in ball security. And then we're just working. Once they get right there in an inevitable situation, two yards away from contact, that's when we want to start grabbing that watch and getting skinny and keeping our eyes up on contact. So that's what we're working right there. Okay, just the little detail to get into contact and then bursting through it right there. So you'll see this in line right there, not a lot of running, but it's, it's giving them a, a pretty good simulation of how it's going to feel when they get in, in, in traffic. Um, and just, and then I like holding the bag too because I can really see from a defensive perspective of where their eyes are, I can feel how, how aerodynamic they are through the bag, and I'll, I'll use that as a, as a way to reinforce the coach the point. Hey, let's go get your eyes up, or hey, I didn't feel you burst through contact on that play, um, on that rep or whatever. And so I, I just I think it's a good way to uh, just to drill that little and get the most muscle memory of 
getting prepared to have success when you get in an inevitable situation. Here's a good rep. We're just running a tight zone. I have a pistol right here. Okay, so all those reads and, and things that we talked about on the other film. Uh, and so I, I'll, I'll kind of post those parts up too, but just another example of doing a great job of hugging that vertical seam right there. Now you create space between him and the defenders. Also, what it does, I've seen the guys make this run right where this pole is, and that makes that, that guy can maybe square us up now and make a little bit better form tackle. By us hugging that, we're forcing this guy to come across the bow and make a tackle, okay? And now we're able to have success. His eyes are up right there on contact. Okay, he's skinny. He's covering it with two, protecting a rock, aerodynamic. And so we're getting both accomplished. We're protecting the football, and now he's got seven yards of contact. I live with that run any day. Okay, here's another one. We're running some tight zone right here. Okay, he does a good job, those little things we talk about. Okay, but right here, he does a great job of hugging that thing, getting, getting two hands on it right on contact. His eyes are up, and that's why it's a little thing, but a big thing. He just gave us an extra two, three yards. So now I just went from a second and a second and seven to a second and you know, four or second and three. And that's a big deal, man. And so that's I want us to get every yard that they're going to allow us to get on these different runs. Um, we saw this clip when I was the tight zone stuff, and then I'll uh, see this, this clip right here. I'll show you just from this. We'll show from this angle right here. Okay, just so you can see. Once again, as a running back, I think this is a short yardage situation. Sometimes this is going to be all you got to work with. I mean, look, I mean, there, this is not a viable gap. You got a guy hanging up about to be fully uh, uh, detached from his block. So this is the only thing we got to work with right here. He has to overcome. These guys are almost like connected with their feet. He does a good job of not hopping through there, getting his foot up and down so he can burst through the contact. Would like his pad level to be a little bit better. But right there, he's protecting the ball, covering it with two. And he just moved that pile for an extra yard or two at the contact. And that's what that's what we're looking for. Any given run, I want to protect the rock. And I want to uh, get vertical and get as many yards of the contact as possible. Okay? And then this last drill I'll cover – as far as ball security. So that, so the Zeke drill, okay, named out there Zeke Elliott, that's, that's what we're working on those, the two hands in traffic um, and, and working on getting skinny, getting yards out of contact. One foot hops, now we're focusing on the inevitable situations where we're, we can't necessarily get two, uh, two, two hands uh, involved to protect the football. We just got a helmet directly right here on it. We still got to emphasize, we still, there's no excuse to have not have good ball security. And so, focusing on maintaining ball security and balance with the defender on the ball side, forces the ball carrier to tuck the elbow, reinforces pad level, and reinforces ball security. Um, so, you'll see here, once again, five yard drill, not doing too much, not, not putting too much strain on them. I think the running backs appreciate that. We just do it right, do it light. And so, what I, what I just have them do is with the balls in their left hand, they're Take two hops off their right foot, and then you're going to burst through the finish cone at the end. So you're doing a good job right there. And so we're just focusing. It's really hard. It looks it looks easy. It was probably deeper into uh, us running this drill, and they they've been used to it. But it's 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 pretty easy to punch it out when they first start doing it because they're just focusing on the foot aspect. Their eyes are down, and it just forces them to have their eyes up once again on contact, and then to really focus on. Having ball security, no, no excuses for not tying our feet in with, with great ball security. And so you'll see it, just this couple of examples right here, getting the foot up and down, really tucking that elbow um, right there, and, bur and bursting through the uh, end with our finish. Okay, so that's the drill. And then here's, so I'll show you what I mean by some of these inevitable situations. And I honestly, I used to just do the drill like, maybe two or three years ago, I just did it just for a way to reinforce ball security. But I honestly didn't know that this situation comes up more than I think, than I thought. Like where there's a guy on the ball side, you got to keep your balance. You want to get more yards, but you still got to protect the football, but you can't cover with two. Um, it's not really a cover with two situation because there's one guy there. And so here's, here's a situation right here, right there. So he's coming. He made that guy miss. There's another guy right there on contact. He doesn't have time to get that second. 
Okay, but he's got to have his, he's still got to tuck the rock, there's a helmet right on the ball, but we want to still keep our balance and get more yards under contact. And he does that right there and has a lot of success on that play. Okay, here's another example. Okay, this is down the field example uh, right here. So I'll speed it up. Okay, just right here, just more, more emphasis on, on how we stay vertical in the running game. But right here, here's another situation. I would have liked, the ball was going to the right side. Somebody asked this question, so I want to address it real quick. If we're running a play to the right, I want the ball to be immediately in your right hand. The reason why to say if this ball stayed front side, that's what the, the all the chaos is coming from your inside hand. So if these guys are flowing to the ball, I want you to have that opposite hand free for, for two reasons. Number one, it's a ball security issue if I'm willingly giving these guys a, a free shot right at the ball with the helmet. The second thing is let's use our inside hand free to be able to stiff arm, rip through, same foot, same shoulder. And you can't, those are things that you can't do with the ball in your hand. And so that's how, that's a, key, a big thing for me in a ring game. If you always have the ball to the to the side that you're going to, um, so that you can keep that inside hand free. So here the ball should, I mean, it just ended up going off the back side. So I understand why it got it in the right hand. Can't really switch it because it's got to run it right in, um, right on his on his arm right here. And so he does a great job. There it is. Just like I was just standing there punching at the ball in that drill, he's punching at it right here, desperation, and we we shrug, we not only protect the ball, we fight and get more yards, and we, we keep the ball protected um, in, in the meantime. And then one more situation right here. Okay, here's a different scenario. So we're here. That guy comes off the uh, tight end block, punching at the ball. Okay, you see how he hugs that thing tight to his body, but we're still running, moving forward and getting yards up in contact. And so these are those are all different, a um, few different scenarios. Here's, I guess, I think this is the last one right here. I'll just show it just so we can we can see it here. But right there, use his stiff arm. Okay, and this is why you need to have that ball to the side that you're going to so that you can use that stiff arm right there in that situation. And now here that guy shows up right on the ball. He does a great job hugging that thing tight to his body. And one, just once again, from a coach's standpoint, I shouldn't be able to see that football from behind from the butt copy if you're hugging it in the right uh, the right way. Okay, so that's um, that's those are just a few um, ball security things that not everybody that I know does that I feel like could have provided some value. I know there were some ball security questions uh, when I when I tweeted out you know what guys wanted to know. Um, I really hope you guys got something out of this. Um, and I, I try to give you just not not overwhelm you with a, with a bunch of information, but just kind of some nuggets that I, I believe in as a coach. Uh, with all this thing, with all this being said, as a coach, there's the old adage: there's many ways to skin a cat. I firmly believe that. I, I really do believe that. It, it honestly doesn't matter with the, the exact coaching points that you give, as long as that you can you can provide a why for the coaching point to the players and and do that willingly all the time. Uh, they always hear me give the why, but also to have conviction with the coaching point and double down on it daily. Don't give them a million coaching points so that they're all, they're just trying to figure out what you're talking about. So I want every day they're going to hear the same things. Hey, hug, hug the press the vertical seam. Uh, you know, hug the vertical seam, press the heels, stay square. Those are things. Those are buzzwords that they're going to hear daily. It's not every day. I'm not coming with a different coaching point for what I, how to how to verbalize press the heels, you know. And I think this the muscle memory and the the repetitiveness of that creates a creates a mindset um, and an understanding in the room, and it paints a picture for what you're trying to get accomplished. It leaves out the gray area. You can double down on it daily in the film room when you're standing behind watching another person take a rep and all those things. And um, that's just what I believe in. But if you have confidence. In any of these coaching points, as long as you're confident and there's there's a rhyme and a reason behind it that you can verbalize to the players, I think you're going to be in a good position as a coach. And that's that's just uh, kind of what I've always believed in. Uh, do we have any questions, Justin? Uh, yeah, we got a few. So uh, I know a few people were asking uh, in regards to possibly obtaining the uh, or sh if you'd be able to share that that uh, template that you're using before that PowerPoint uh, that you're using. Some of the, like some of the some of the uh, the, the sheets or whatever, the pages we yep. could, you know, they couldn't really see. Yep, yeah. If uh, Just reach out to me 
and I'll, I can send it. I can send these the cutups as well as um, that that uh, presentation via Dropbox. And so if you don't have a Dropbox, just make a free one, and then just shoot me your information. And I'll send you a Dropbox um, with you. I'll send it to your email, and you'll be able to open it up. Um, done that. I'll probably send these. All of this stuff, I'll probably send it out to seriously like 75 coaches just this year, this offseason. Um, and this, I'm willing to do that, man. It's, this is all of our, this is all of our information. Like this isn't mine. Most of this stuff I got from other people. Like I said, Caleb, he got me the, the uh, study notes, but I just added my own twist to them to make them my own. And so I'm not the guy who thinks like, oh, well, I'm gonna hold these coaching points to myself um, so that I create. I could be different than everybody. Like we're we're all in this thing together, man. And, um, there's we're all coaching the same stuff, but just in a different way. And so if it can provide value, always uh, feel free to reach out, and I can get it to you for sure. Here's a few questions, Coach. Uh, yeah. you, you know the offensive line calls, and do you feel that's important for a running back coach? Uh, for the coach, yes, I think it's important to know, um, like. Last year, we would have a couple of wrinkles, like on the backside of uh, a wide, if we run a wide zone, we might uh, tug the backside, um, you know, where the guard kicks out on the four eye and the tackle wraps around it. I, I like knowing that those things, and, and some of those things are valuable to tell your, run, tell your running backs. Um, I don't tell them every single thing, um, only the things that, that are gonna help them be a step quicker, you know what I mean? So if, if we're running like a tight end insert, play or something like that, I'll, I could say like, hey, if you see a three technique right here, you know the ball's going to probably go in the A gap or whatever it may be like. But I try not to overcoach things that aren't absolutes as a running backs coach. And so um, I don't know if that answers the question. I like knowing it just because, I, I, I mean, this is what we get paid for. Like I love learning football, learning all the different, you know, schemes up front so I can have a deeper understanding as a coach. And then um, – I'll, I'll let the guys know what they need to know. If it's a coaching point that doesn't mean anything um, to to the scheme or as far as our read or anything, I won't say it because I don't want them thinking about what they're doing on the backside when I've been trying to freaking preach for two weeks just to keep them on the front side. You know what I mean? For sure. And so that's kind of that's kind of my philosophy on that. Cool. Um, so you, you have a running back that has two or three fumbles in a game or two. What advice uh, do you give them to bring him back into the game, confidence, et cetera? So I think it's just you got to know your guy. Like you got to know, you got to know each of your players, coach the way you got to coach them individually. So I've been, I've had some guys where you can go get them right now. Like, Come on, protect the ball. Like, you know, you know better than that. Like you can get on real good and all of that. There's other dudes that you got to just let them chill. Like almost wait until the freaking the whole drive. The, the defense has been out there for eight plays, and then they go the night play walk over. Like, hey, keep your head up, man. You protect you just got to protect the rock you know and so I think a lot of that comes with the with the way I coach with ball security being such a huge emphasis and just a core quality that you got to have in my room and we take pride in I think it helps that they kind of have their own they're already going to be more mad at themselves than, than I am I'm going to be really when I get there I mean we're all going to be mad right but it's not like they just put the ball on the ground and go over there and start laughing and think you know, well, it's not that big of a deal. Like, it's going to hurt them, you know, because they know the, 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 the standard that I have for them for that. And they know how much – because I preach how much it can hurt our chances to have success in a game. And so I'm still going to address it, you know what I mean? But they, I'm, I'm going to just tell them, too, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to get you going back in there. But, dude, you, if you, you can't be just putting the ball on the ground. So I knock on wood, I've never had a guy put multiple on the ground in one game. Um, and really, I don't think I've ever had – a guy put multiple on the ground in one season, to be honest, that I can think of. And so I've been blessed, but that goes back to the culture that you said. You don't have it's, – it's a lot more work on the front end, but you don't have to deal with some of those things that come up on the back end. Um, and, and, like, number five, he was the guy for us last year at BYU. He, his ball security wasn't great when he first got there, but I emphasized it with him, and I told him, like, dude, I need, we need you on the field. And the worst thing that, that can happen is – you put the ball on the ground and then I'm looking over at these other guys and they're like, so you're going to treat them different, you know, than, than us, if, you know, if we put the ball on the ground. And so I just really emphasize those things daily with those guys and let them know the importance 
And uh, it's the way I coach, I've been blessed. Right? The type of guys that I've been coached, it usually means more to them than, than most, you know, when they put the ball on the ground. They're going to be pretty down on themselves. And so I need to gauge the, per the way to, to approach that situation with each individual. For sure. Um, any any uh, recruiting advice for a young coach uh, looking to close a deal on a recruit and, and sell his school? Um, I think it's about just being genuine in general. Like from day one, when you start with the kid, like developing a genuine relationship with them, uh, try to get to know the parents if that's a possibility. Try to you know just try to know them deeper than just like, hey, how was your weekend? Hey, you look at our weight room, like those type of things. They're good, but everybody's saying that, you know, like try to try to figure out what what's going to give you an edge, you know, with that kid, you know, just with whether you work your relationship, you talk, you know, you know, the the coach. Um, I think that's important. Just the, the key and the whole thing is just having genuine relationships with everybody in the recruiting that that can affect recruiting, like mm -hmm. high school coach. Like I want to have a. If, if a high school coach follows me on Twitter and reaches out, I'm going to follow up with him. Like, he could be the, the recruiting coordinator and the JV offensive coordinator. But, those, you know, just having a relationship with those guys and cordial, you know, and being, you know, just being normal to those guys, that you never know. That might be the one relationship that is close to that kid, and that might be the difference. You know, like, you know, you would think that his – the OC or the head coach would be the closest, but sometimes that are still a guy on the staff, like, you know, the the guy that just graduated from college that they put down on the freshman team, that might be their mentor or whatever. And so I think just developing genuine relationships with people, whether it be the, you know, everybody on the coaching staff, guys, other coaches in the area that can give you feedback, trying to get to know their parents, getting to know them, um, just people that – people that are going to make a difference in their, their decision making and not doing it only because of that. Like I'll, I'll say like I've developed relationships with high school coaches years that they did. They would tell me like, coach, why are you even stop by my school? Like, I don't, I'm not, I, we haven't had a D1 dude in five, six years. Like, why are you even stop by and just developing genuine relationships, not so that they can do something for you, but just to show like, man, I'm in this thing for the long haul. Like you're gonna be, you're gonna be coaching. I'm gonna be coaching. We're trying to help. We're all trying to get these kids um, to to college. You know, obviously we want them to come play for us to help our team. But we're really in this thing together. And uh, I think just the more genuine you can be with, with any type of relationship from the top to the bottom, I think that helps. That could be the difference between you getting a kid and not. Uh, I agree 100 percent there. Um, if if play is tight zone. Uh, if play is uh, tight zone right and you're running into the three with a shade backside, which lineman do you read? We're always going to read the play side. So if it's so if it's an even front, we're going to read the first thing outside the center to the play side. Um, if we were a little bit like so, so we were the like I said the near leg of the center, the play side leg of the center, or really the back side leg of the center was was our uh, read. Um, so. It's, it's backwards when you run a tight zone, though. So let me take that back. If we're running a tight zone right, they got it. They're in the over front. So the, the three is to the right. There's a shade to our side. We're reading the shade on that. We're reading the back side, the first thing to our side, if that makes sense. However you want to you want to verbalize it. I, I always say, I don't say back side with my running backs when we run a tight zone. I say you want to read the first D lineman to your side if you're in a, in a uh, over front. Because I don't want them thinking front side where the ball should go to the front side, the ball shouldn't go to the back side. I just, I'll turn it that way. You want to read the first defensive lineman to your side in, a, in an even front. I front, you're going to read your nose, and I'll tell you where to go. What advice, what advice would you have for somebody looking to achieve their dream job? I this is, I tell this my my brother's a coach too. He, uh, he actually just got to uh, he's been a high school coach the last two years up in, down in Houston, and uh, he just got the ball state as a GA. And this I tell this to him, somebody that I care deeply about, or just coach to anybody that asks me. You got to be present in your current situation. That's the that's the quickest way to get to where you want to get to. Is 
not selling this this current situation short because you're thinking about, hey, how can I get to this next step? And uh, I always use a biblical analogy, the story of King David. Um, um, that's my, my core, my foundation is, is, uh, is my faith. And so the thing that I put in, in King David's perspective, if you know anything about his story, he started off as a shepherd. and He was actually anointed to be the king. He knew he was going to be the king even when he was a shepherd. That didn't make it. He didn't just sit back and stop taking pride in being a great shepherd. He, he didn't go, you know, in the house and kick his feet up and just wait 15 years until it was his opportunity to be a king. He freaking grinded and worked his butt off even when he knew that his dream job was coming at some point. And so he was, he was the best shepherd to ever do it. You know what I mean? Like the lowliest job for a male back in those, in the biblical times was like a shepherd. Like that's like worse than a GA, you know, like that's, that's like worse than a volunteer coach. Like you know, the shepherd, people were just a shepherd back then. And so he took pride in it though. He was like, shoot, if that's, that's my current situation, I'm gonna be the best shepherd ever. And I'm gonna wait for that promotion. Got, he went from being a shepherd to, uh, to slaying Goliath, had that, that monumental moment. Him making taking the most making the most of that opportunity provided him an opportunity to be the leader of the army, be the best warrior to ever do it um, in in his time, and so he he excelled in everything that he did because he was current, he was present in those situations. And so once again, if you know the story, he went he went through that 15 year progression to becoming a king. And even even in his, like we don't know if we're ever going to get to our dream job as coaches, like we were hopeful for. This guy knew that he was going to be a king, and he still took pride in his, his responsibility. The guy continued to get there more and more on his plate. And uh, I just think that's what we're called to do in our profession as well. Like when, when I was at Rice, I wanted to be the best running backs coach they ever seen at Rice. And, and that was not just because for personal accolades, that's just the approach that I took. Or even when I was a GA, I wanted to be the best GA I could be. And then, then I got promoted, and then I went to BYU. You know, man, it's a great opportunity for me. I, when I was at Rice, I would pray for this opportunity at BYU. And so at BYU, I tried to make the most of that opportunity. I was able to do that. You know, um, I worked hard, did, did what I was supposed to do, checked that box, and then another opportunity now I'm at Arizona, you know, presented itself. And so I think that's that's how you got to approach it, man. And we don't know. Like, we don't we don't have it. Like, even David, he didn't know it was going to be 15 years. He just knew that it wasn't right now that he was going to be king. And so he just kept working towards that and put his head down and didn't, he wasn't sitting here looking like, oh, how is this dude the freaking king right now? And I know I could be better than him and like feeling sorry for himself. You know what? I ain't even going to work hard as a warrior now because the king, like this dude, man, I ain't never going to be a king. He didn't have that mindset. He just put his head down and freaking just went to work. And uh, that's why he got to where he was. That's it right there, man. Uh, well, one more, Coach. Uh, I, I, it's more, uh, have you ever taught your backs to read the backside backer versus reading the down lineman on your tight zone? Uh, no, and because to me it doesn't make to me it doesn't make sense to to read a second level, but then still have to address the first level at, at, at the same time. To me, that's backwards. Like. I think you need to address what's in front of you first and then let the second level sort out. The other reason I coach that way is because I use that coaching point, the vertical scene. And so really the linebackers don't mean anything to us once you get that mindset. We're just looking for that block to, to take place the way that we're expecting to, expecting it to. So the, re, the other reason I like it is, to me, if you're reading a linebacker, you're, you've got a better chance than them guys are taking a ball and bouncing it and not pressing the heels and forcing that linebacker to really make a decision and also allow our, our alignment to work the double team up to the back. And so to me, you got to address the front first level first. Um, because that's going to that's going to help you keep the emphasis on pressing the heels and creating the timing needed to have success on that play. Um, I just personally don't believe in reading second level on zone. I'm not saying that if you you might know a way to coach it and, and get it to where it's 100 percent that it'll make the read right. I just, to me, it's, it's hard to, for me to think of a, running, a freshman running back coming in, me allowing him to do that, and then not taking me a whole two years just to get this guy to learn how to press the hips. And so that's, that's why I personally believe in that uh, philosophy when it comes to type, any type of zone, type of scheme. Awesome. Coach, um, do you want to share your, your uh, contact information, whether Twitter, email? Yeah, yeah. On, uh, 
Follow follow me on Twitter, and I can get you. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my email. Follow me on Twitter. It's Coach uh, underscore Stewart S T E W A R D as in dog. Um, you can find me on Twitter and and uh, reach out to me. I'll follow back. And then also my email is a uh, Stewart S T E W A R D the letter A at email dot Arizona dot edu. It's Stewart A at email dot Arizona dot edu. Awesome man. All right. Coach, I just I just tweeted out that that's the way to cap off a, a good day at clinic talks, man. You dropped some drop some major gems in this one, man. I appreciate that. That was tremendous, man. Seriously. That was awesome. That was awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I appreciate you coming on. And uh, you know, once again to all the coaches that that took the time out to sit in on all these talks today. Um, you know, much much respect to y'all and and you know, coach alluded to it before, and we've been talking about it since last week, but it's a it's a time where you know, we're looking to just do this thing together, man, lean on each other and continue to build. And I think that's most important. So everybody's doing it. It's, it's reflecting in the fact that we're getting 60, 70, 80, 100 people, 110 people, 200 people in these, uh, in these clinic talks, man. And it's, it, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. So just want to give a shout out to all the coaches, not only the ones presenting, but the ones uh, coming in to, to learn and, and continue to grow. So absolutely. Coach, appreciate it, man. That was awesome. All right, bro. Appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, y'all have a good night. We're back at it tomorrow morning. We got a few sessions tomorrow.